The Manchus are famous for their centuries-long rule of China from the mid-17th century until the formal end of the Qing Dynasty in 1912, ruling over China through some of the country's strongest, yet also some of its weakest, periods of history. With over 10 million people today claiming Manchu ethnicity, the Manchus and their ancestors continue to be for many the subject of both fascination and detestation. Together, let's take a look into their history. This will be the first video in a multi-part series on the Manchus, Jurchens, and those who preceded them, so make sure to subscribe to see more. The exact origins of the Manchus and Jurchens are hard to pinpoint, with speculation connecting them to various groups described in early Chinese records, such as the Su Shen, Yi Lo, Mo Ji, Mo He, and lesser Ru Zhe people, many of whom shared cultural traits and roughly similar locations with the future Jurchens and Manchus. However, those who recorded these early peoples generally paid little attention to their ethnic and cultural differences, regarded them as barbarians, and often described only the most powerful groups, with names shifting alongside changes in the political situation. The earliest of these people, the Su Shen, were perhaps a loose conglomeration of tribes of primarily Tungusic origin that lived to the north of the Chinese. The Chinese first documented their existence in the 6th century BCE. Like the later Manchus, they farmed, fished, hunted, lived in pit houses, and very notably, styled their hair into queues like other Tungusic peoples. They also fletched wooden arrows with flint heads, which they presented as tribute to the Chinese. Living in semi-terranean houses was a way to deal with the harsh cold of Manchuria. Similar types of houses can be found among other peoples of northern Eurasia. According to Chinese records, they lived in caves during the winter and forests during the summer. They are connected to the Xi Tuan Shan culture in modern-day Jilin province, which was active during the 1st and 2nd millennia BCE. Chinese dynastic records and Qing official compilations all link the Su Shen to the later Manchus. The Yilo oftentimes believed to be the continuation of the Su Shen, of which they were contemporaneously, in some records, also recorded as, were active during the first half of the first millennium CE. Like the Su Shen, they presented the Chinese with arrows as tribute and lived in pit houses. They raised pigs as livestock and made clothing out of their hides. They also produced sable furs and red jade, which they traded. Occupying the valley of the Mudan River and its tributaries, they were subjects of the early Korean kingdom of Puyo, until a successful rebellion in the 220s against high taxation. They were again subjugated by Kwangato the Great of Koguryo in 398 CE. From Manchuria, they would conduct raids into northeastern Korea during the summer and sailed in boats to plunder other polities. It has been said though that Chinese documents may have emphasized their similarities with the Su Shun in order to connect contemporary Chinese polities to earlier ones and increase their legitimacy. The Moji often pronounced Uji people, were active during the middle of the first millennium CE and possessed a culture which, according to archaeological evidence, was similar to that of the earlier Su Shen and Ilo. They had stockaded settlements with round semi-terranean houses with central chimney holes. They rode and exported reindeer. The Chinese noted them as being drunkards, as they also would the Jurchens. They were known to dress in dogskins and traded sable furs with the Chinese. Their economy was based primarily off of hunting, fishing, and gathering, with limited agriculture. They were a politically divided group known for being fierce fighters, and like the Koreans and later Manchus, they believed Mount Pekdu to be a sacred place. The Moji were replaced by the Moha, who first appeared during the late 5th century and were likely not the same exact group. A conglomeration of multiple groups which were primarily Tungusic, they had many Sushan descendants, and similar to the previous groups, lived in semi-terranean stockaded settlements. Like the Moji, the Moha also rode and exported reindeer. They were a primarily sedentary group that grew soybeans, wheat, millet, and rice, in addition to raising pigs and horses. They also hunted and gathered, harvesting the goods of the forest. Like the later Jurchens and Manchus, they held slaves. The Moha people constituted a significant portion of the Kingdom of Pare, which was ruled by a Koreanic upper class descended from the people of the former kingdom of Koguryo, which had been extinguished in 668 CE by the allied forces of Tang China and the southern Korean kingdom of Shilla. Pare, founded in 698 CE, was the first polity in the region to develop urban centers and be politically recognized by its neighbors. Pare's economies produced pigs, 
horses, long-haired rabbits, preserved vegetables, copper, falcons, pelts, pearls, and ginseng. Artisanal skills flourished, and Pare became known for the iron mining and smithing skills they learned from the Turks. Many local names in the region continue to have the word for iron. The Heishui Moha or Black River Moha, a subgroup of which the population was subject to Pare, are generally considered to be the ancestors of the later Durchins, who became the Manchus. The term Moha mostly disappears from the historical record after the fall of Pare in 926 CE. The earliest record of a name which could denote a name like the Jurchins is from one of the Shirwei tribes, the lesser Rujar, who presented tribute to the Tang court in 748 CE. Otherwise, they first appear in the historical record in the early 10th century. They provided tribute to the Kitan, Liao dynasty, and Korea. It also provided tribute to China, which it did primarily via sea through the Yatong Peninsula. Originally from the dense forests of eastern Manchuria and the Russian Far East, in the 10th century, they spread into the Manchurian plains, their settlements centered on the Sungari River. The Jurchens would switch allegiance between the Kitans and Koreans out of convenience and play both against one another. Restrictions on trade with and tribute to China resulted in the Jurchens allying with Goryeo to defeat the Kitans in war in 1010 CE. To the Liao dynasty, they were divided into the civilized Jurchens, who were under Liao rule, and Wan Jurchens, who still lived in the forests and were outside of the Liao orbit. The people of the forests continued to practice hunting and fishing, while the people of the plains raised cattle, horses, and engaged in agriculture. The Jurchens exported various goods such as horses, hunting birds, sable furs, gold, pearls, beeswax, pine seeds, and ginseng. Their hawks and falcons, used for hunting, were eagerly sought out by both the Ketons and the Chinese. They dressed in thick leather boots and brightly decorated knee-length tunics made of felt or hide. They consumed raw meat and fish, as well as a strong liquor made of millet, and lived in fortified villages. They were ruled by various chieftains, the smaller ones having control over a thousand households, and greater chieftains ruling over several thousand. The Jurchen had semi-egalitarian traditions and had a relatively free, decentralized decision-making process. Despite this, the Jurchens practiced slavery, which was considered an acceptable penalty for criminal offenses and personal debts. While the predominant religion was shamanism, Buddhism was also introduced to the Jurchens from the Korean kingdom of Koryo. And that's it for this video. Next time we'll be seeing the rise of the Wanyang clan and the establishment of the Jin dynasty. Thanks for watching and make sure to like, subscribe, and press the bell button to receive notifications for any new videos. And please leave a comment for the algorithm.